Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Hey, welcome back to the Gospel Addict Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Greg Bryan, joined with my other co-host, Jim Reske. Jim, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. How are you feeling about this? I'm excited, Greg. I'm ready to dive right in. Well, let's let's do it. You know, sometimes we say a lot of fluffy stuff at the beginning and That's right. people fast forward over all that stuff <laughs> so we're just going to dive right into second corinthians chapter six this is kind of a what do we call it like a first look at a passage that i'm going to be teaching at a men's bible study so these are kind of like first impressions first thoughts so sometimes we're just kind of processing right out loud and you know we may come to a different conclusion by the time we actually teach the passage that's right. So, right. right. But this you is get to kind of, we like to have, and you, are we saying you, I'm sorry, Greg, I cut you off. You're saying we get to hear those things. And yeah. So we're going to just uh, read. I say we start with uh, one to 13, see how, how far we get. Usually we like to just say a quick prayer, Lord, um, just open our eyes so that we might see the wonderful things you have for us in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll go ahead and start reading as chapter six, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, And in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying yet we live on, beaten yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. What are your first impressions of this? Well, so I do think this is a little continuation. It seems that Paul kind of defending himself. It's interesting. Because we think now if someone sounds defensive, it's it's a sign of weakness or it's a bad thing. Oh, you know, you, you know, if you, you're just sounding defensive and you shouldn't do that. It's it's somehow it's um, untoward, it's un, un, impolite or it's it, it, it's a bad reflection on you if you sound defensive. So you almost want, don't want to say Paul sounding defensive, but he kind of he's, he's kind of defending himself. He's compa- he is defending himself. He's he's comparing himself to these. Um, fake apostles that are the, the Corinthians have become enamored with. And it feels like a little bit, you know, I don't know, in, in the U.S. we have these, um, uh, oh, uh, some real history of televangelists that have these ministries, and they're still around, uh, who who have become extremely wealthy. And um, oftentimes because they preach a gospel that is the uh, Called the prosperity gospel you know god wants you to go first class god wants you to have made many blessings all you have to do is give to my ministry and god's going to rain blessings on your head and um 
So those people are very slick. So they're very popular. They have a huge following. Um, they fly in private jets and live in great houses and and they're very, very, very successful. Um, and I think that if, I can, I'm just picturing as I'm reading this, Greg, that the Corinthians were really enamored with people like that. And they said, these guys have it going on. They are and they're extremely successful. They're great speakers and they're uh, smooth talkers. And they're telling me the kind of things I like to hear. And then Paul comes around and Paul is always, he's homeless for crying out loud. He's always wandering and he's suffering and it's not successful at all. If God was really with Paul, he'd be blessing his ministry, right? And he wouldn't have these hardships and he'd be living. I mean, it, and I think Paul's just taking that head on and saying, you have no idea what apostleship is like. We suffer all kinds of hardship for you, for your sake, right? Um, that, I mean, that's why again, at the end, he's, he says, you know, we are great fond affection for you. We would like that we like that to be reciprocated. You're, you're withholding your affection from us, you know? Um, anyway, that's my first thought. And I, I didn't mean to go on for too long there, Greg, but what do you, what do you think? First of all, let me just make a note here that he's, he, he, you know, he starts out like in verse three, he says, we, so is he, you know, he's saying we, it's just not Paul. He's not saying I, right. So this must, you know, this, this must include Timothy because verse one of chapter one of second Corinthians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Yeah. We must be referring to, they also were doing the same. They were treating Timothy in the same way, yeah, interesting. but it definitely seems like he's definitely seems a little defensive here. Basically. Hey, we're, we're not withholding our affection from you, but you're withholding it from us. Yeah. And he's pleading with them to open wide their hearts also. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's drawing such a contrast between a Christ-like way of life <clears throat> and that kind of, you know, um, the kind of successful life that the, the Corinthians were enamored with, that the Corinthians liked, and they that they saw as evidence of God's blessing, apparently, right? And Paul's like, you know, Timothy and I are involved in real true ministry. And we're doing, you know, hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, imprisonments, riots, beatings, <laughs> like we're suffering all these things. That's not evidence that God isn't with us. It's evidence that, that this is the, the, the Christian way of life. In other words, this is the way of life that we, that we, these are the things that we are willing to put up with in order to reach the world with, for, with the gospel, right? What do you think about verse one? Because it's, it's a fascinating verse. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Oh, yeah, look at that. What's he referring to? Is that like because they receive God's grace, but then they've fallen back into works or yeah, yeah. Um, kind of like we, we've talked about, they've, they maybe started, started out by grace, but then fell back into works righteousness well, if, they, if what you're saying, they were Judaizers, right? They've definitely fallen astray and gone into that kind of legalism, that kind of worse righteousness, right? That's my understanding. Yeah, so if they, uh, right. So, so they, were, they were gen had genuine faith, you know, when they started, but now they're following the false teachers and the wrong teachers, then yeah, that's gonna, it's definitely gonna stunt their Christian growth, right? They're gonna go astray. I like this though. In the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Wake up, right? Wake up before it's too late to really go down the wrong path and follow these false teachers. Yeah, I like it. I think I, think, I just say that how we think of you know, being defensive as being distasteful somehow. But in verse four, he says, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. But the way he's doing it is with troubles, hardships, and distress. I'm not bragging. What he's bragging about is like all these weaknesses, right? Which what does it mean though? What does it mean to receive God's grace in vain? It means to receive the goodness and favor of God, yet to hinder the work of grace in one's life. It means it to receive the favor of God and to fall and to fail in what Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Think about 
the parable of the sower, Greg, right? So some seed falls on the different types of soil and some sprouts up quickly and fades away in the heat of the sun and right, some falls on rocky soil. So people receive the grace of God, but it doesn't always take root. And some people don't never grow in Christ, never go very far in the Christian life or troubles and tribulations come and they fall away, mm-hmm. right? Or they follow false teachers and they say, no, I've, you know, I think this prosperity gospel, which is just one false teaching popular today, but over history, there've been many kinds of false teaching, right? Is this referring to though, the struggle that, you know, we, uh, we that we seem to all have like, okay, who's, whose responsibility is it? Do I do it or does God do it? Mm-hmm. You know, do we rely on him or do we, you know, do we work out our salvation and fear and trembling? Is it, is it, I wonder if this is what he's talking about. To me, it's like my, my initial thought on this is that when he says, I urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, they received God's grace when Paul first preached to them yep. and they came to know Jesus and their lives were changed. Yep. And but the question is, it's, it's how they've been doing since that time that they've somehow fallen back to receive it in vain would be to to basically end up in worse worse shape than had you not received it which to me is almost to become to fall into like such a a legalism you know a cult-like legalism that does more harm than good in in a person's life i i don't know he's warning them about it so it's clearly possible it's clearly possible to receive God's grace in vain. I need to look at that more. Well, do you want to read the end of the chapter 14 to, because maybe this helps. Sure. It's an interesting pivot. It is an interesting pivot. So we just finished up with uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 13, and I'll start reading here in verse 14. Uh, heading in my Bible, and by the way, we all know these headings in the Bible are not part of the original scripture. They're just added later by people to help understand the break up paragraphs, but the heading in my Bible says warning against idolatry, if that helps. Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean, touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There's some familiar verses in here but that we've all heard about like like verse 14. Yeah, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. A lot of times people interpret that as marriage, right? Yeah, I think in the context, don't you think he's talking about those super apostles? Yeah, it doesn't sound like there's really nothing about marriage here before or after. But that verse is almost is very, very commonly talked about. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers too. As a as a as a Christian, you should not be married to a non-Christian. And there are other passages I think that talk about that. So I would I would say like that whole like there's like a primary application of this verse and then a secondary okay application so um, I mean a secondary application might be for a person you know well obviously not to not to marry an unbeliever or it could be could another application could be you know you know work with unbelievers and and to me but that's like a you can't that can't be across the board right because it's impossible for every christian to be working with uh to be on you know well that'd be like uh throughout history there have been some christian communities that have tried to do that like the puritans or the shake i'm not shakers were like that but you know try to create um i think in um John Calvin tried to do that. I'm not, but but try to create a little Christian community, a little Christian utopia on this earth where we could just be with Christians and no one else. And those things don't really last. And I don't think God, that's actually God's design for us anyway. God wants us to be, remember the title of that book by, I think it was Becky Pippard, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the Yes. 
right? So not just Christians staying in the salt chair, all together, clustered together. I think God wants us to be through the world. Certainly that's where Paul lived his life. He didn't say, I'm just going to stay here with the other Christians in Jerusalem. He was, you know, around the world spreading the gospel. But in this context, I think it is talking about those other super apostles, the other false teachers. Don't be yoked together with those unbelievers. What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? This makes me think of Romans 12, 2, which talks about don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the idea is that like, how often do we let the world, worldly thinking, how often does it creep into a church or a ministry? We have a, a good idea of what was happening in the Corinthian church. These other leaders came along and started teaching worldly, you know, thinking or not godly thinking. Right. This is pretty strong. He's trying to say, you got to make a clean break with these guys. Yeah, I mean, if you take it right in context, you look at verse 13 and verse 14. Yeah. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. He's pleading with them to open his heart. And then he's like speaking truth. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. I think he's calling out these super apostles, calling them unbelievers. Yeah. And yeah. maybe... That might that must be kind of shocking for those Corinthians because I'm guessing they they wouldn't have thought of them as unbelievers. Right. I think they're actually pretty enamored with them. They thought they were pretty they were pretty popular there, right? So yeah, So he's they, trying to get them to come to their senses. And then these last passages here, for we are a temple of the living God. He has three quotes here in a row, right? Talking about kind of being a holy people. You know, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. That's verse 17. But I jumping back to 16. I will live with them and walk among them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. And then 18, I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters. What do you think he's doing there, Greg? Is he like kind of trying to say, this is kind of what God's vision for a thriving church really is? But like when I established you in Corinth, when I... Because Paul was there for 18 months setting up this church. So as he's saying, when I set this up, this is kind of the vision that I had that you would be this kind of thriving body of Christ in this town and growing it in that way. Well, part of what I'm seeing here is that he's trying to pull, he's trying to get them to take their focus off these men and put their focus back on God. How so? Okay, so what he's not doing is he's not saying, take your focus off these guys and put your focus back on us. Ah, 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 okay. He's, he's saying, your focus is on these guys, these super apostles. Yeah. You need to go back to the, come back to the Lord. Like, I see he's being very God-centered in his kind of rebuke or um, kind of calling them out. Well, and I think, look, look at the end of 17, he is calling out, he says, not just come out from their midst and be separate. So make a clean break with these guys, these false teachers, these super apostles, touch no unclean thing and I'll receive you. That's like a little slap at those guys. If they're there, they are the unclean thing that you should not be touching. You should make a clean break with. But then maybe 18 is really like a rec verse of reconciliation. Like with it. So there's very strong in, through, uh, through verse 17, like you've got to make a clean break with these guys. Look, in, in 6, 16, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? I mean, it's just it's a really harsh language. But then 18, when he says, I will be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Very conciliatory, very full of love and affection and communion with God, right? You've got to sever this relationship we have with these guys. They're leading you astray so that you can be restored to that kind of loving whole, whole, whole relationship with God. I'll be a father to you and you'll be son, my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's just off the, what I'm seeing off the top of my head, Greg. That's what I'm seeing. I wonder if chapter 7, verse 1, ties into it. Since then, we have these promises, dear friends. And, and listen, he, 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 he kind of he calls them friends. Yeah. Let us. Let us he's including himself, purify right. ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Absolutely. He, he's all of a sudden now he's putting him, he's, he's, 
he's calling them back to fellowship with with the lord and he's putting himself saying hey i need i need to purify myself too from everything that contaminates body and spirit yeah it's it's really this really great greg uh studying this with you because i think i just always heard that vote that verse talked about in the context of marriage and I, I i think it is a little different here i think it is talking about don't be yoked with these false teachers these super apostles they're leading you astray and, and by the way we missed this and i i have, i'm not sure i'm pronouncing it right verse 15 what harmony is there between christ and belial i think another version says Baal. that's Baal. like a that's like a like a demon right it's it's a word borrowed from hebrew meaning worthlessness or wickedness here it is used as another word for Satan. Oh, wow. So he's really slamming these guys. The term <laughs> no? is used only in this place in the New Testament. This is very it? Very often in the Old Testament to express men notoriously wicked and scandalous. So he's really, if he's pulling that word out, he's really slamming these guys. Well, he's basically saying that these super apostles are really sure. from... From like the devil. The, yeah. Yeah. They're well, really because they're leading people astray. Yeah. They're not just like off a little bit or, you know, yeah, they're really evil. <laughs> it's really strong. That is very strong. It yeah. is very strong. He's uh, deeply, deeply concerned. Well, this is lessons for us today, Greg. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to get enamored with super successful, slick preachers and, you know, um, we talked about before, and lots of times in uh, uh, Christianity, people, pastors start to, the leaders, Christian leaders start to rank themselves by how big their churches are and how big their successful their ministry is. And and that is definitely not what Paul says we should be seeking after here. Easy for things of the world to creep into the church, too. You yeah. know, yeah. supposed to be world changers where we should be in the world, but not of the world. As we're salt and light in the world, we're changing the world for the glory of God. Yeah. But boy, it's so easy for the opposite to happen, for the world to creep into the church or into, into ministries. And next thing you know, we're operating like the world. We're following leaders who are basically maybe shallow or have little or no faith. Well, it's a scary thought when, when you start thinking of like ministry as a job <laughs> that, yeah. that anybody could apply for and, 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 and do. Right. As opposed rather to the than, Lord's leading and the Holy Spirit pull, calling you into it. and Yeah, and rather than ministry you. as a calling. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think this is a good place to stop for, for now. So Yeah, I'm uh, excited for chapter uh, seven now. Can't wait. Yeah, thanks for listening into the Gospel Attic Podcast. Please stay tuned. We will continue our journey through 2 Corinthians. Next stop is chapter 7. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.